Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. We've got a few people still to come. So in the meantime, we might just start, uh, start off with some good old technical logistics. Uh, if you can raise your hand by clicking on the, the raise hand icon um, in GoToWebinar. If you can hear me, if you can see this message on the screen now. Thank you very much. We've got a few people raising their hand. She tells me that on our end, things should be working. If you can't see a message on your screen with a dark blue background, let's try minimising some windows you might have open. You're looking for a go-to webinar interface. There's a little pop-out um, that goes along with the screen you should be seeing. And on that pop-out, you should see a question box. If you can pop in the question box where you're dialing in from today, that would be awesome to hear to hear where or to see where you're coming from. Um, you can see a few people in the question box already, so it looks like it's working. David, thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. It's always a good sign to see that some people uh, that that everyone can hear my question because the answers are coming through. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If you are also um, maybe emailing or texting a friend of yours who's trying to get on but can't hear, just tell them to do a sound check um, or check their speakers. The other thing I find works really well is switching to phone call audio and then switching back to computer audio. For some reason, that always uh, fixes it. Perfect. Um, and worst comes to worst, everyone will receive a recording of today's webinar. So if you've got a friend texting you madly saying, I can't hear anything, don't worry, everyone will get a recording. If not tonight, then first thing tomorrow. So without further ado, let's talk about what we're here to talk about. We're looking at moving from remote to blended learning today uh, with Stephen Kolber, who is um, a literacy improvement teacher from Brunswick Secondary College. It's very modest, so I won't say anything else except to let him speak, uh, let him and his expertise speak for itself. Uh, we're very lucky to have him for the next hour um, going through some of his tried and tested techniques, some of his strategies. He's doing fantastic work with recorded video and flipped, um, flipped classroom learning. So we're very lucky and very grateful to have him with us today. We will have some time for some questions as well. So now that you've found the question box, feel free to pop in any questions that pop up uh, in there and we will have, we'll have time to go there. Uh, and um, get Stephen's wisdom. So I won't um, take up any more time. Stephen, please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, all right, lovely people. Hope we're all doing well today. Let's see, can we see my screen? I hope so. So basically, yeah, the, the plan for today is a little bit different to the usual. Um, through consulting for ClickView, we've produced a series of videos on sort of my consolidated learnings into maybe 20 to 25 minutes, a short little segments of about three to four minutes videos explaining how to do what I've learned to do. And so rather than kind of take you through stuff that you can then follow up on the click through library website and so forth, I figured uh, I'll try and kind of contextualize a little, a little bit in the Victoria where we are right now, or at least I am as proof by the masks hanging on the, on the door behind me. And so my name's Stephen Colby. You can find me on these various places. You probably won't want to at this point just yet, but you might uh, like to get in touch afterwards to sort of touch base on how, how your school's been doing or uh, how you yourself have been teaching what you've learned. You know, if you want to seek out any further assistance or share some great ideas that you've got, uh, that would be amazing, of course. And whoops, what have I done? Something wrong, there we go. Uh, so basically I'm all about flip learning, instructional video. Uh, I run an academic reading group called Hashtag EduReading and Teachers Across Borders Australia are a non-for-profit that I'm the secretary of and we take teachers to Cambodia to instruct and develop pedagogy in Khmer teachers. So again, if that's anything that you're interested in, let me know. So just before we jump in some more tech on top of our tech, uh, we're going to be using this platform, uh, Poll Everywhere. Um, you may or may not have seen it before. 
So if you're on a desktop or similar, it might be nice to open a separate tab and type in this URL. If you're like most people uh, and you're on your phone, you can open a separate tab or you know do a two screen device setup where you've got this on your phone so you can respond and you've got to open on your computer or whatever larger device you have. So I'm gonna pause for a moment. So you've got that there, take a screenshot, take a photo, whatever it is, type it into your browser URL. Uh, and I'm hoping Amanda will do the same so that at least I'll know that hers are coming through well and working properly, but otherwise it'll be a lot of me talking and I'd prefer that you contribute as well. So I'm gonna I'll move pop it into the, into the chat box as well. Thank you very much. Alrighty, so just a bit of a reflection of where we've been. Um, I'm in a relatively unique position. People keep asking me to write or to speak about lockdown and what it's been like. Um, I'm conscious that that's not the case for everyone, so I'm going to try and do a little bit of a sort of what, where we've been, what's going on, and how our life has sort of changed dramatically. What? I keep doing it wrong. What am I doing? There we go. All right, so I'm going to take you back. This to me was an, uh, the GP was running on a Sunday, I believe, and we were in lockdown within a couple of days of that. And so I remember my father-in-law was staying with us and he went off to the GP and lined up with all these people. And at that point, we were still not really sure whether that was something that should be happening or not. Uh, and very quickly, we went into lockdown. And so re remote learning 1.0, I've called it. Because uh, it's at this time I was like, oh, this is fun. I'm sure this won't be for long, and you know, we'll we'll just you know forget what we've learned and sort of move on with the normal, the regular way of teaching. Um, some people may or may not remember our PM told us to go back to school. This to me was a, a flash light bulb moment that reminded me of this time, so I was chucking it up for us. 2.0 is what I'm calling when we uh, high school teachers, at least the 11s and 12s, and the uh, prep to 10s were still at home and the 11s and 12s were at school. Everyone was in masks. All the teachers were sort of spread out and removed from one another. So that was an odd time. And then, you know, then we sort of went into proper lockdown. Remote learning three, which is what we're in now, or at least what I'm calling now. And so just a quick jog through memory lane to see where we're up to and what's going on. So this is your first little prompt. And uh, let's see if technology upon technology will work for us today. You can also text, apparently it costs nothing. But hey, it works. So the question is, what form of teaching did you find most challenging, face-to-face, -face, remote teaching, or part face-to-face -face learning? And I will pause and drink. None of the above, wow. You're all better humans than me, I guess, the people who are picking that. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, something dramatically changed. Okay, all right, okay. What? I'm mostly confused at this point. All right, so it looks like remote teaching and part face-to-face -face and part remote learning is the winner. And you're all better people than me because some people are saying none of the above. All right, so I'm gonna press on. That is oh, oh, very interesting. I like to see them jumping around. And so, okay, re well, remote teaching seems to be winning. All right. So. I'm gonna pause it there, we're gonna move on. It looks like remote teaching was the hardest, but that also uh, part face-to-face -face and part remote learning was more also difficult. Uh, we would probably call the third option something similar to blended learning, but obviously the kind of chopping and changing was definitely the hardest part. So thank you for contributing. Uh, and also, wow, good people, none of the above. Um, I'm gonna talk you through how we did teaching at my school. Um, I've recently just had a piece published in professional practice for the AU about it. And so, you know, there'll be references and things down the bottom. So as always, we are quite regularly uh, building the plane as we are trying to fly it, or, you know, what is it? Cutting a tree while we're standing on it or something similar. So uh, blank slide to remind me, by my back of an envelope count, we've been doing uh, this remote learning business perhaps longer than Maybe anyone else in the world. I've said that a couple of times. No one's corrected me yet, but feel free to do so in the chat if I'm way off because that's more than likely possible. But, you know, we've been doing it for a very long time. I think there's real uh, intellectual property for us as Victorian teachers uh, who have done this for such a long time. So this is where we bring in my school logo. This is very much what we did. So offline activities were quite minimal for us. We used our learning management system, which in our case is Compass. We used instructional video, which is something we've I've been banging on about for about four years. 
and we added in video conferencing, which is something that we trialed before. And we sort of, you know, uh, myself and the head of digital learning had sort of mucked around with it when we were off sick and those sort of things. Uh, but then this really kind of drove home <laughs> that the utility of it, let's say. And so for me anyway, according to my, my thinking, uh, the three challenges are engagement, collaboration and connection. So engagement, the, you think about the students that have dropped off or gone missing or you know, AFK away from the keyboard. Collaboration, getting that to happen in an authentic way online is a big challenge and there's a lot of research on it, especially in higher education. But obviously that fails to take into account that in many respects we're dealing with very young uh, adolescents who, who have slightly different brain wiring than uh, your average higher education participating student. And of course connection and so just keep, you know, keep those three things in the back of your mind as I'm going through this, this sort of content that I've got for you today and each one is trying to target one of those things in particular I guess. And then just for you know, ease of use we sort of ran, ran this against the two items against one another to me, instructional video, it's not that engaging. Um, it is kind of, you know, it's pretty good, but it's not, you know, fantastic. Whereas video conferencing is good for connection and collaboration. So I think a really good mix of all of these are important. Uh, we minimize the use of LMS at the start. We we're using it a lot and then we dropped it right off as with on offline activities as well. It wasn't a big concern for us as an inner city school. So, well, we're already there. Uh, what could or should we keep doing? So for me, uh, as you'll no doubt guess, instructional video is the thing that we should keep doing. Uh, we've got using Teams in there as an example. So this is, let's pretend overnight COVID is removed. Uh, we all are free to move about our homes. What could or should we keep doing as individuals, as a school, as a library as a what's something that you really think is worth keeping because obviously there's a lot of things that uh, were not ideal video pace okay interesting has anyone got do you want to if you what oh, pace okay ah, pace oh yeah okay uh, I'm guessing did pace speed up or slow down would be my question flip learning keep learning of course video <sighs> Well, you're in the right place. Project based. Okay. That's not something I did much of, I have to be honest, but I would love to learn. Initiatives, creation, well being, support, project based is a big, big, big one. Put it on my to do list. Flip That's learning. Yeah, it makes sense. The, um, Online. Combination of, uh, of teachers doing the live teaching versus that project based kind of set the project and then. You know, it means they have less sort of face-to-face -face, um, or time spent face-to-face. -face. I suppose it's a logistics thing, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but that's a very good point. It'd be a lot easier to have sections that are student-led rather than teacher-led. Okay, now I have to click, click my neck to keep up with what's happening. <laughs> Methods, representation, putting parents themselves, recorded meetings, links. Mindfulness, oh, okay. If anyone wants to type in chat what they came up with for mindfulness, that would be a great idea. That's more my wife's jam than mine. I always hear her taking, my, taking her students through mindfulness and I think one day I'll be that. That was then. <laughs> Click view, whoever put that. Good job, Amanda. No, just it wasn't even <laughs> me. The checks in the mail, no, no. <laughs> All right, mentoring, <laughs> reaching, blended. Yeah, beautiful. Check-ins, professional webinars. Oh, except for webinar fatigue, I'm with you on the webinars. Programs, channels. All right, I'm going to jump ahead or I'll get, uh, I'll completely use my mind. Uh, all right, one of the things I'm going to keep doing is random grouping and random number generate generators, generation. Uh, so I've always read, like especially Dylan Williams, if you think of that's one of his big things, popsicle sticks, and in primary schools at least they do it physically. Um, to me, I started using this app because obviously cold calling in a, you know, addressing the field, as it's called, when you say, does anyone like to share? Obviously, uh, that's a terrible way to get people to share. Uh, and so I started using this app in particular. You enter your class list, 
you press random, you, you can do groups, you can do orders, you can do lists. So for an example, my English class, they had a oral presentation coming up. So I randomly put them into a group uh, to discuss it. And then I randomly used a random number generator to give everyone a topic to discuss for a practice. And then finally, the order of the oral presentation was done by this random grouping thing. So this is something that I've always kind of at the back of my mind thought, yeah, 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 that would be good. But for me, remote learning uh, made that essential. So hence we did that. That's just my one. Yours, uh, to be honest, a lot better. I'm actually project learnings on my job list of things to do. So I'm gonna, again, bring it back to my school, hence the logo. Uh, we're just uh, around the corner from ClickView. So obviously if anyone wants to come swing by or see what we're doing or anything like that, we're always open to that, of course. And so this is kind of the, the bits and pieces coming together. Um, the pink and the green writing is very uh, Inception, no, the Tom, Tom Cruise movie where, he's, where everyone's writing on glass all the time. Uh, we call that a light board uh, and essentially it's good really, it's a, it's a whiteboard made out of glass. Essentially you flip it while you film and then it's useful for diagrams, science, maths especially, do it a fair bit. Pictured in the center there is Derek Glennie, he's our head of learning technologies. Uh, and there's me presenting in various things. Top right hand corner, something we were very excited about, our maths teachers produced a uh, differentiated sort of lesson sequence. And so there are about 20 or 30 different videos taught by different teachers in the team, all covering the same content, but from different levels. And so that was their kind of fully differentiated activity that we were really impressed with. And I just happened to walk past the class and take that photo of one student who was being taught by a different teacher to the one standing in front of him in the room. So I'm going to mute this because from memory uh, there's no sound and this might chunk a little bit because we're live streaming it but this is our space where we where we make these videos or where we can make these videos. Obviously we had to stop during remote learning but we will return to it I guess and that's something that we will try and make an embedded practice rather than just something that people picked up and put back down. So. I'll talk you through it. We've got a whole bunch of different screens, of course. Uh, we have some swivels, a whole bunch of tripods, QR codes to kind of tell you how to do it, um, a whole bunch of different things like that. It's a very small room. Uh, this is our green screen that makes videos like this. Again, this is Derek presenting on psychology, year 11 from memory, but I could be wrong. Don't test me on that. This is our assistant principal presenting on nutrition and uh, things like that. This is our principal, this is her address from term three, basically pushing for cameras on and asking questions of your teacher. So these are sort of, and that's Independence Day for no reason except to make myself laugh. Um, so these, we make videos that are front facing. So for, you know, students, parents, but also for teachers. So this kind of a podcasting setup. That's a swivel that we use for classroom observations. Uh, this is just a, an ideal little spot for us to do web conferences. We've got sort of lighting and things like that. Importantly, it doesn't look uh, incredible, uh, and that's because we did it largely without any significant budget. A lot of this is just kind of, um, you know, handmade type situation. Obviously, this looks better when you produce it properly, uh, but just an example of what it might look like and how it could be used, and a whole bunch of different things that we use in there. Um, all of these are non-essential, um, but they are very nice to have, I believe. So for me personally, again, I'm gonna mute myself. This is my first video I ever made in on June the 6th, 2016. Uh, and you can see uh, it's wonderful quality. That's, uh, that's what my camera looked like on my issued computer back then. And uh, you know, it's a cool logo, some dodgy logo that I made in five minutes. And the reason that I did it is this is me explaining something that I'd taught for four, maybe five years in a row at this point. Let me work out the maths, probably five years. Uh, and so I always delivered the same PowerPoint. It felt like the PowerPoint was, you know, the bee's knees. It, I had my first, second and third explanation and it was good to go. And so I sort of thought, I wonder if I could record this and save myself, you know, a life of repeating an old PowerPoint that, uh, you know, I will go through forever. So each of these techniques and it's explaining a task and so on. Whoop, and somehow I'm just talking here. This is the most recent one. So this is for the VATE conference that was last Sunday. So you can see a slight, I hope, uh, a slight quality improvement. Again, the difference for the students is probably just ease of use and convenience rather than needing nice technology. But 
you know, I feel like, you know, just in the same way you would spend a lot of time making a PowerPoint for your students look really good, be precise and have a nice design, uh, the same applies for video. And so as of now, we're getting close to half a million views on YouTube, about 560 videos. And as a slow process, those are gradually being uploaded and updated to ClickView as well. So that's why I do it. I don't like teaching the same thing uh, the same way, always. Uh, but when I get to a point where I feel like it's done, then I decide that it's done and turn it into a video. So we're going to fly through the research uh, because this gets to be a bit heavy and not everyone's as interested in academic research as I am. Uh, but the, the basic thing, if you've ever been to any technology conference, someone will mention TPAC. It's basically a concept that you've got technology, you've got pedagogy and you've got content and that they're equally important. I would say that during remote learning that became less true and maybe the T element became a lot bigger because if you don't know how to run a collaborative group or you don't know how to do a, run a breakout room or you don't have the technology to do it or similar, then obviously that would be a lot more difficult. And so, yeah, we always felt like the technology focus was combined with these other two elements, but during remote learning, most of the PD uh, that we were focused on at a school level was technolo technologically based. So why? Uh, greater flexibility. It's more accessible for students with disabilities. We probably don't have too much time to go into that in detail now, but for students who are neuro, neurodiverse, so they might have ASD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, those sort of things, having audio and video together is what we call the multimedia principle. It's essentially better, take my word for it, so you don't have to read the weighty papers about it. And it allows you to assist multiple students at once. So I think when I first began, I didn't really picture what that would be like once you had a, a library of videos at different levels for different tasks, and you could sort of, you know, give students feedback via video. It basically, in my case, it's kind of a long-term investment in your work-life balance, your well-being, and you know, you invest some time early, and then years down the line, you're still benefiting from that work. And so Lastly, it's superior to other forms of learning resources. So, you know, you give a student in a lab a worksheet, you give them a PowerPoint, you give them a PowerPoint that's being read out loud with audio attached, and then you give them a video, and you can very clearly see the pattern that video is superior in that situation. So that's why I do it. That's some of the research. Again, I will not go into too much detail here, but cognitive load theory, cognitive multimedia theory of learning, the names always get jumbled around in my head. Flip learning is a pedagogical approach, so that's one of the options. Uh, that's not something I talk about too much, uh, just enough to sort of ground it as a possibility. Video modeling in special ed is kind of life skills and those sort of things. They use video for that a lot. Assistive technology is a range of different technologies that, again, from special ed, they use to support their students. And to me, video is one of those, at least in the secondary school setting. Uh, not excluding it from primary school, because I've definitely seen it used very well there in sort of a station rotation, students sitting around in circles, rotating through different skills and different knowledge pieces. Uh, the videos tend to be shorter and so forth. And finally, universal design for learning. So, you know, trying to make content that is accessible for all students uh, who have the internet, which is probably a bigger question, a policy question that I don't need to address too much here. All right, so we don't talk about uh, e-learning sort of changing the world, but we do talk about it in terms of affordances. So I'm going to pause for a moment to give you some take up time to read this and then I'll sort of give you my running commentary, but just take a moment, read those, try and work out what they mean, and then I'll do my best to explain it as we go. All right, so basically they can learn anywhere, anytime. Uh, they are actually involved in it. It's multimodal, it's recursive, which means you make videos based off what they've told you. It's kind of part of an ongoing feedback loop. Collaborative intelligence, I like the sound of that. Uh, metacognition, a lot of the videos that you'll end up making or that I've made are basically me explaining the thinking that I'm doing as I'm doing certain things, annotating a book, reading a book, uh, writing a sentence, writing a paragraph, structuring a piece, planning a piece, uh, all those sort of things. And of course, differentiated. 
And this is actually quite a short article if you want to seek it out. It's very good. It might be useful to take back to a leadership team and sort of talk them through why it might be worth having, you know, maybe a closer look at technology, video and blended learning going forward. Okay, so what does this say? Make rank these actions from most to least used during remote learning. So if, uh, if it's worked properly, you should be able to sort of on your screen, push these up and down, but perhaps that's not the case. Uh, so basically, which of these you, did you use the most? So if you use them the most, they're at the top, and if you use them the least, they're at the bottom. For me, I would put video conferencing pretty close to the top, maybe below then teacher made video content, but I'm gonna pause. So when click. you um, when you go ahead and click on one of the options, guys, there's a there are two arrows, one up and one down that pop out to the left hand side. Uh, so if you click on the arrow up and down, that will move it around. Here we go. Beautiful. Okay, LMS. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So video conference is number one. It's actually very, very interesting to think of school policy on how much video conferencing was required. And it's probably a separate study in itself, how much video conferencing was done, how much video conferencing was expected to be done. Cause I think, I think of my own experience, uh, it wasn't as, you know expressly put forward that you needed to be on camera the entire time, but there's certainly an urge as a teacher to sort of do that for your students, I guess, and kind of, engage with that okay down the bottom we've got teacher made audio content makes sense podcasting or something similar collaborative work via video conferencing is near the bottom okay self-guided work for sure online source video content love it set work via lms and then teacher made video content and video conferencing okay so to me uh as long as you uh, had video conferencing as some part of your process. You've already made an instructional video. Uh, you just didn't record it. And so to me, as someone who's been kind of talking, presenting, leading, <laughs> trying to lead my school and my colleagues around this idea, uh, this is quite a pleasant thing to be able to say that um, everyone, or yeah, let's say everyone, everyone at my school and most people that I know have now made an instructional video that they either recorded or failed to record or forgot to record or didn't want to record for various reasons. Okay, so we've got, yeah, okay, video video is in the top three uh, and everything else is below that, which is good to see, interesting to know. Okay, how, um, if you want to type in the chat how you did it uh, or how you ended up making, not video conferencing, because that's probably a pretty binary Google, Microsoft, go to webinar WebEx question. But if you want to explain how you made videos, um, maybe I'll take you through the ones that I would suggest. And at the end, we'll pause and uh, perhaps reflect on if anyone has any different approaches. So to me, the general rule is always, if your device has a camera, press the red button and you're probably pretty good to go making a video. Uh, record a meeting in Google Meets and Google like Google Meets and Microsoft Teams, two separate things, don't blend them together. Um, I always found the quality on that not ideal. So my wife and I did a couple across both platforms, but in my experience, it's much better to do it natively within software. And a lot of people suggest different options, but open broadcast software or online broadcast studio, again, the names change for me, but this will basically let you record your screen, record your presentation, I used this just this morning to do a practice run of this presentation, just to record my screen and my camera in the top right hand corner. That's easy mode, as it said there. Um, if you use Microsoft, your Microsoft school, uh, you can do it natively within stream now as of about probably a month, two months ago. So create, record screen, just there as an option. Again, quality is not ideal, but it is sort of native to what you're doing if you're a Microsoft school or person. Uh, Flipgrid, we won't go into too much detail about, but this is a really good way, low barrier for entry for students to use. So to have uh, video responses. And so in the bottom right hand corner is the academic research group that I run. Every month we read an academic article and people share short three minute reflections on questions 
that are linked to the article. So for me, for students, you might uh, get them to do, say they were planning an essay and they recorded short, uh, short little insights into what they were thinking for their essay. And I was able to provide verbal feedback rather than written feedback, which for me was saved a lot of time. And it really helped them before putting pen to paper to kind of clarify their thoughts. We've had teachers use it for experiments. So students would make experiments at home and uh, you know, demonstrate, what was it? Sort of like we ran a marathon or something, relay, something running related and students would record their workout and upload it. So just different options, ways you could use it in that way. And last of all, basically, uh, I just wanna show you my MacGyver setups of basically people around the world who have essentially used what they've had uh, in their native you know, place, wherever that is. One of these is me, but I think the rest is sourced from people on Twitter and around the place who are sort of seen doing things that caught my eyes interesting. So this kind of, the basic concept is you put your screen over something and then you've made a document camera. But what's next? What I want to do is pause for a moment and tell, share with us, if you could through the chat, ways that you made videos, perhaps if they're different or the same. So we sort of had document cameras using Flipgrid, Stream, camera, recorder meeting, OBS software. If anyone's got any different or perhaps more interesting. I've got interesting, a couple of suggestions. Uh, um, Charlotte has been using or sometimes used animations like stop motion, which um, sounds mm. super fun because it's usually more of a creative, um, you know, creative kind of, uh, venture but for instructional videos that'd be super fun yeah nice one yeah zoom as well as being oh. mentioned it's really easy to record a meeting of yourself on zoom um, and mm -hmm. apparently microsoft stream's got some awesome hidden recording functionality in the ios app with whiteboard stickers filters uh, loom has also been mentioned and of course the clickview app uh, where you can record straight into your workspace just off your your phone mm -hmm. or your device yeah, nice one. Caught me out there. I forgot to add that in at this point. Good point. No, you didn't. <laughs> so we've got Loom, Zoom, <laughs> Click View app, uh, animation. Yeah, I originally I had sort of stuff about animation in presentations that I did, but people kind of just found that too confronting to think that not only would they be talking to a camera, but going through stop motion and whatever. But yes, that's a very good point. Um, mm. Sort of explain everything is really good on an iPad as well uh and all sorts of things any others there before we move on uh screencast is a is a something that comes up often so that's been mentioned and narrated powerpoints which i think is another low like low barrier entry for teachers too because everyone's got powerpoints so you don't necessarily have mm -hmm. to reinvent the wheel you, like like you started off with your you know comment commentating your your powerpoint and recording them it's a great way to start you've got everything you need mm -hmm. Definitely. I'll just say for the people using Screencast-O-Matic, OBS is free and it does the same thing. That's my only two cents, but I know it's much more popular. They obviously have an advertising budget, whereas OBS doesn't. Narrated PowerPoints, definitely. Click view, loom, zoom, animation, beautiful. I'll definitely be adding to this PowerPoint. Thank you very much. All right, so at this point, we're trying to think of changes. Um, so just before we uh, started this call, I was reading about chaos theory which apparently is a good, a good way to think about schools because schools are complex systems. And it was basically saying that the fitness of a system is its ability to kind of survive change. And I think there's a real threat that our education system will remain exactly the way that it has, uh, because if it's shown us anything, it's shown us that it will bend, but it won't break. And so, to me, my focus is very much on the individuals. I know that me personally, my skill set and my mindset have both changed dramatically. As we saw in the earlier slide, someone said pace, and I'm assuming that they were saying slower pace. I'm hoping. I can't imagine a way to teach faster during remote learning. At least I hope not. Or if you have, if you've worked it out, let me know. So what I want us to pause at this point is think about, obviously your skill, has, skill set has changed but whether or not your mindset has is kind of our challenge, I guess, as we, for many of us, return back to face-to-face -face school, the old way, talking to people. I can't imagine how nervous I am to do it again after so long. 
And so basically, yeah, mindset is what we're trying to shift because uh, I know for a fact that a very large number of us have had our skill sets changed dramatically. Okay, so the obvious question is, how have your skill sets or mind mindsets changed after or during or as a result of online learning? And again, I will pause because I'm very interested in what we came up with because the future of our system will largely depend on our skill sets and our mindsets changing. Maybe focus on mindsets because that's a little bit trickier. Well, hey, we'd get them as full sentences. Good. I'm glad I picked that. Accepting of mistakes. Oh, okay. More ICT savvy for sure. Skill sets, ICT capabilities, love that. All right. Yeah, sure. Self guided. Mm. Right, yeah. Not comfortable, but it works, yeah. When it's, I mean, when it's uncomfortable, the there's learning, isn't there? Mm. And I wonder I who was learning it's... more the students the teachers. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's been a lot of um uh, a lot of commentary around, you know, oh, I hate the sound of my own voice and I hate the, the way that I look on the camera and things like that. And that's also been a bit of discomfort. But stop motion is also if you make yourself a little clay version of yourself, that's one way to get around it. Change mm. your mindset. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even if you think of my first video, I didn't have that challenge because I was barely visible because cameras weren't that good back then, or at least the built in ones weren't. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, PE classes. Woof. That mm. is for a lot of people that do what I do. PE is always like the seems to be the hardest to get into. Maths and science teachers are all over it. If you go to any conference on flipped learning, blended learning, uh, there'll be a lot of science teachers, a lot of maths teachers, very few PE teachers. So if that's uh, your specialty, I'd recommend kind of get in touch with uh, all the conferences that are happening because that is a very rare skill set for sure yeah um, with our other students listening in for sure oh reaching out beyond my organization be keen to hear more about that it sounds very impressive and good yeah like i can't believe i didn't trust my students to do as much group work as we do now i guess connecting through the screen tell us how you do it <laughs> Demonstration food study classes. Yeah, okay, nice. Again, food studies. If you've ever wanted to present at a conference, hit me up. I'll put you in touch with some people because that is a rare combination of making videos and food studies typically. Failures. Okay, I don't, I don't like the language of failure, but yeah, okay, I'm with you on that one. Accepting failures. I can think of about 100 of my videos which are failures, but hey. That's, that's why statistics are a terrible thing to look at. <laughs> <laughs> this video has been viewed three times. Oh, okay, there's 28 <laughs> kids in my class. Oh, that's not at all. Anyway. All right, okay, let's see. What did I miss down the bottom? Self-guided, yeah, great. So, I mean, this is, we did some, did a kind of survey of the teachers at our school, of course, as I hope everyone else did. And yeah, these are the sort of themes that came through. Now it's a matter of how do we fit it together. You don't record almost all my classes. Wow, that's you're you're more committed than me. You should be presenting. That's that's incredible. Uh, different relationships with students. Yes. Oh, tell me about it. It's like <laughs> last lesson I had uh, one of my year eight students brought his puppy, and so periodically through the lesson I would ask him if he could uh, put the microphone part of his headphones close to the puppy and we were able to hear it snore throughout the lesson which is something I definitely would like to take forward into the rest of my classes having an on-call snoring puppy. Um, poll is full okay good that's how I know to move on. All right so now we've talked a little bit about videos and how to do it there's a whole bunch of other ideas that I didn't cover that are more, a little bit more complicated that's probably why I left them out mine is sort of low barrier for entry as I said I at points I kind of talk about these sort of things in Cambodia and as a general rule they don't have laptops or desktop computers and so it's almost always mobile phone based mobile device based so hence I try and keep my bar as low as possible 
if you ever manage to catch me for a webinar, then we'll go in a lot more, not a webinar, an actual face-to-face -face thing where you bring your devices and we make some stuff. And we can talk about that there in more detail. And of course, at the end of this, uh, the last section of this is just me telling you a hundred different things you can go and watch. On click view, off click view, everything's for free, except for one thing that I think is worth the money that you pay. So we're going to transition into blended learning. So how do we actually blend in what we've got, what we've done, what we've learned, the things that we've uh, just sort of gone through then, uh, the contributions that we've had. And so again, rather than read, I'm going to pause because it's the only slide that has chunks of text on it. I'll give you a couple of 30 seconds to read this and then we'll sort of discuss it. Okay, so by my reading speed, I'm done. Uh, basically, uh, most often I talk about instructional video because that is a practice, that's a skill set, that's something that you can learn to do. Split learning and blended learning are both pedagogies and they will look very different depending on who you talk to, what their focuses are. So that will be something that we'll talk about um, if you were to use, uh, so for the, say the person that recorded all of their lessons, you now have a resource that meant that means, whoops, in theory, uh, you won't necessarily need to stand at the front and lecture your class. You may choose to, you may not, depending on how you want to play it. Um, but there is the potential for there to be more time in class. And so this is where blended learning comes in. Flip learning is relatively linear. It says they watch the videos at home. In class, we do you know, collaborative discussion, project-based, all those sort of things. Blended learning is, a, as it sounds, a little bit more flexible and a lot more blended, let's say. So this is something I've uh, written for a book chapter on inclusive practices. And I'm not gonna read these to you or even expect you to read them, but six different ways to use video in a classroom. Basically, the first is not using video, which is just lecturing what we all do. I'm not saying that in a negative way. That will always be part of teaching. I certainly hope, unless we're replaced by robots, but that's a side note. Shared viewing. So think of, you know, you've got the projector up at the front, you're pausing the video, hitting that space bar and asking students to discuss, what do you notice, pointing at things. It's a very legitimate and engaging way of doing it. Partial flip is, you know, as it sounds, uh, some students are being lectured to, some are getting a flipped video section. Uh, In-class rotation is a really useful way to have students uh, collaborating, but including video. So you might have different skills groups, high, medium, low, you might have uh, you know, a million different ways you might group your students based on their needs, attending to different things at different points. Blended learning is what we're talking about here because uh, you know, we're trying to be reasonable. Full flip, you're thinking uh, modern university courses uh, enact a full flip in that, especially nowadays. Most of the, all of the lectures are videos that you watch before and then in theory, at least, uh, in the standard delivery, you would then go to a tutorial. So you would do the talking and the speaking and the human element separate to the content delivery phase. Personally, I don't know any teachers that have fully flipped uh, yet, uh, but if you meet one, then uh, give them a medal from me because that is a, a very large commitment. For me personally, I get stuck at about blended most of the time. Okay, so using your class time, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of what excites me about using my class time of late. I don't have pictures of my students, of course, because that's uh, a thing that we uh, do not do. Uh, Socratic circles, it gets me excited. You've got an inner ring of students having a conversation. Some people call it a fishbowl or something similar. Inner group is having a discussion. The outer group is observing. Uh, we've actually got a really brilliant space at school where there's a tables you can draw on. So we often have one of the students uh, with all the names of the students in relation to where they're sitting and they draw connections which are the sort of the discussion and where it goes and how it bounces around and then that gives you some sort of really interesting formative data where you can say to your students you know let's look at the the grid the chart the spider web whatever you want to call it ends up looking like a spider web usually uh, and there might be some students that didn't say anything or there might be some students who just uh, did what we call ping pong which is go back and forward uh, rather than building additively on one another's conversation. And then you go to the outer ring and they discuss 
you know, they might, uh, as teenagers, they're often more blunt than we might like them to be, but they might sort of say, some people were dominant, some people were less do dominant. So you're sort of achieving two goals. Your students are engaging with text always. So you get them to read an article or piece of content, whatever your subject is. They're doing two things at once. They're learning how to have adult conversations, which is something that, uh, you know, in life, you kind of have to have meetings and discuss with people and reach consensus or have arguments and so forth. Uh, and so they're learning content and they're learning how to do speaking and listening. That excites me. Uh, gamification is something I did for a, a whole year with a select, sort of SEAL select entry student group that got me excited. Um, I've actually made gamified video. So students are watching speeches from different people and their job is to locate tone or techniques or kind of arguments, sort of all, all, all sort of different ways of approaching it. And then if you're a click view person, which we all are, thank you very much to the department. You can do it through interactive. So back then I, I made it quite poorly to be completely honest, but the video is structured in a way where there are pauses and there are moments for students to fill in things, tick things, cross things off and so forth. Uh, ClickView does it so much better that uh, I wish four years ago that uh, we were a ClickView school. As you can see here, what does it say? 92% completed it. And I'm actually marking their results live. So we use Teams as our platform. So I had Teams open and ClickView Interactives open. I just put the video in and I inserted questions. So, you know, he, Leonardo DiCaprio in this case talks for a small amount of time. Then a section pops up that says, what tone was he speaking in during this section? The first one, very formal, not surprisingly. Hello, everyone, yada, yada, yada. And I'm live responding to students' questions then alt tabbing into teams and saying, congratulations, Naveed, uh, the word, uh, you know, agitated was a very good choice for that section. And so this sort of live feedback loop happening on two different platforms. So if you've made a video that has some kind of learning intention even or a success criteria or a stop and take notes, kind of anything where you're actually looking into the camera and asking them to do something, that's a really good way to do it live uh, remotely, but also of course, face to face as well. So those are my two, what was it, three, two, three, who knows, my three most recent, interesting, exciting things that I would like to do more of within, you know, the class. And so if you think as that one person who's done all of their classes as videos, um, just pretend that you never had to teach your content again and the students just matrix style had it in their brain, what is something you would like to do more of within your class? Collaborative tasks for sure. Role play of a courtroom. Yeah, nice one. Jigsaw activities, love it. Again, something I should get back into. Blended learning, that's the goal. Class discussion, got it. Connection between students. Yeah, my the uh, the courtroom, my my students, we did a remote remote learning courtroom discussion. We had three groups, the sort of defendants, the judges and the, you know, persecution, let's say. Uh, I would say it would work a lot better in class if I'm being honest, but it was very enjoyable. The students were, there's a lot of banging of hands on desks or whatever they were sitting on at the time. Evidentiary reasoning sessions. Oh, nice. <laughs> and some people got their answers. Yeah, nice one. Maybe like a Matt Stalks type of format, online collaborative space. Yeah, for sure. Video recordings by students. Oh, I left the sli those slides out for this one. Yeah, that's something that I'm happy to share. That's a great idea. Did you have much success with that, Stephen? Did most of your students get on board? For which one? Recording themselves, uh, recording videos of their own performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, the most recent example is really uh, embarrassing, but we're preparing for a Macbeth uh, exam. And so we're talking about the la Lady Macbeth and the witches and they have rhyming, the quotes that we're memorizing are rhyming. So I made uh, a rap song. I don't rap, so it was very <laughs> cringe, let's say, as the student said. And then one of my students is actually quite good at singing. So praise be, because she sounds <laughs> a lot better than me. And so she's currently uh, remastering, let's say, or just replacing my dodgy singing. 
attempt. Got it. So yeah, it's that sort of thing. You kind of you go with the strength rather than force everyone to do it, I guess. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Good. Great responses right. here. Yeah. Storage of data overseas. Yeah, it's a good point. Fish balls. There, yeah, there you go. That's great. Be more encouraging. Yeah, for sure. Creative outputs really. I mean, I guess we know our students a lot more. We know that they're capable of, you know, quite creative outputs, which we may not have known um, due to the whole sort of thing that we've got happening. Peer teaching. All right, I'm going to fly to the end because I don't want to leave you without uh, sort of some learning takeaways. Got 10 minutes. So I'm going to hopefully be there. There'll be some time at the end for me to respond. But I'm just going to dump a whole bunch of information or things that you could chase up if you're on your phone or whatever. Get your print screen out. Um, but just quickly, yeah, I would say be brave, share your work. Obviously, try get over your own uh, discomfort with the sound of your own voice um, as much as possible. This is not something I worry about too much, but you know, without full hair and makeup, it's fine to speak to your students directly. I think. Well, I would like to say so anyway. Check it on YouTube. There's a new platform called Free School that is, you know, similar. Um, they're trying to match it a little bit. Uh, Click View, of course, is great. You can set up your own dashboard. I remember the day that you look at this panel. Um, I always looked up to the people that were on there. So uh, Amy Shattuck, Amy Shackleton, all these people. I remember thinking like, oh, one day I'll be like these people. And now that's me there in black and white for some reason. I can't remember why I made that choice, but. Uh, these are sort of featured channels, but of course, there's no uh, barrier to creating your own, own channel, I believe. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Any of the recorded content that you have, you can upload it to your workspace. And if you are, you know, uh, like Stephen or aspiring to be like any of these featured channel hosts and you do have, a, you know, quite a library of them, then definitely get in touch with us um, by the content team. Beautiful. And it'd be great Perfect. to share it all with the rest of the ClickView community. Yeah, definitely. And and properly tagged, that's the main thing. <laughs> YouTube, you can type in a hundred words starting with all of the content that I've got, but there's no way you'll find it. Whereas ClickView, it's properly set out and teaching related, which is good. Uh, YouTube has 4 billion videos of which 4% are educational, thus proving my point that it's very hard to find what you want. Uh, yeah, so. This is a Monash course. Uh, it's surprisingly uh, text-based for an online course. It's kind of <laughs> a bit counter to what you might imagine, but it's very good for sort of, especially if you've got more of a research bent like I do, it talks you through sort of the research on online teaching and learning interactivity and you know how to do good online learning, which in this case, we're now thinking of blended learning, of course. This is the one paid thing. Uh, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner in that particular shot, they misspelled my name, which was lovely. Uh, the flip learning, you go, you know, you might pay $100 or so. They take you through a course of flip learning, what to do in the class, uh, you know, all those sort of things. It's incredibly valuable, I found in my experience heading towards blended learning. This is what a month or so ago, um, teaching online masterclass came out September 1st. So this is a blend of a whole range of videos from kind of, what is it, sort of social support people, um, neuroscientists, well-being people, people such as myself, talking about pedagogy, inclusion, video, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's a really quite short, like each of the videos is between two and three minutes and you can sort of focus in on it. I've been watching it over the holidays and really enjoying the different perspectives because it's very easy to get stuck in one context. So definitely chuck that in. You can find it through ClickView, Adobe, all sorts of different people have it up, uh, the people that contributed to it. And the blended learning web webinar is what you're in right now, of course. Uh, again, self plug, ClickView plug, let's, let's synergize. <laughs> uh, we sat down for a day and filmed this uh, creating instructional video, which is why I've not gone too much into the nitty gritty of how to do it because I'm assuming that you have ClickView and you're going to go seek this out afterwards if you're keen to explore it. I go through things a lot more succinctly, let's say, than I am right now. Uh, there's also some really good podcasts here. Teachers Talking Teaching is the bottom left. Teachers Education Review did a lot of work on online learning 
and Ollie Lovell from just teaching out in sunshine from memory. Education research reading room are good audio ways to engage with teaching, education, research, all those sort of things. And with exactly six minutes remaining by my count, uh, that's the end of my formal presentation. I'm sure there's slides at the end if you want me to just warble on for six more minutes, but if you've got questions, I mean, a lot of this is a lot of information thrown at you at once. So, I'd, you know, beseech you to go watch it back or pursue some of these other kind of more situated things that you can kind of access at your leisure. These courses and these sort of platforms and things and take your time to go through it rather than just have me throw a whole bunch of ideas at you. But is there anything you think we should chat about? We'll just get a couple of, um, give a couple of moments. Thank you, Melinda, for, <laughs> for your comment. A um, couple of moments for people to type their questions in. Beautiful. Give you some thinking time. That's it, and I've got some thinking time of stuff to look into afterwards. Get back into animation, loom, all these sort of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the interactives. The, the amount of data that I got out of that was impressive, I've got to be honest. The, the old way I used to do it, I think it was like a Google form or a Microsoft form. And so as soon as you send kids three links, there's a pretty good chance they'll get lost somewhere between the link and where they're meant to go. But having it embedded within ClickView and pop straight out was something definitely be using a lot more of when we head back for sure. Definitely, yeah, the popularity of interactives has definitely um, been very obvious. Um, we do have one question coming through from Matthew. He's interested in your impact matrix towards the start uh, of the video that you showed in one of the earlier slides. Um, oh, video no, conferencing was listed as high for collaboration. Uh, your thoughts? Many had trouble facilitating collaboration during synchronous lessons. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, that's almost the entire reason that I used it. Um, so this might be my bias coming forward for sure. Um, yeah, collaboration, I found it really useful to have students either in random groups or in, uh, basically you need a leader is my main experience. So I would ask students, we need you know four or five tech savvy leaders in the sense that they'd be starting their own call or their own breakout room, depending on the software that you use. And they'd be leading the discussion. So they're sharing their screen. Uh, in some cases, they're kind of keeping people on task. I wouldn't call it a jigsaw activity in and of itself, but that's the way that I found it was best to get students to be leading their learning and to collaborating best. And obviously mixing up the groups from the leadership all the way through in the sense that students are working at points with their friends if they're kind of my connection to school seemed low, but working um, with random groups when it felt like the class was quite, you know, on board and alive. Maybe this is, I'm thinking of affordances and potentials rather than actual, but in my experience, that's definitely the, the collaboration that was possible was the only reason that I continue to do it up until today and this week, for sure. All right, have we got anything else? Um, some wonderful um, wonderful comments saying how informative you've been, Stephen, and definitely would like to echo those. Um, very inspiring, great ideas. Looking forward to trialling some of those. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much, Angela and uh, Lily and Monica and everyone else that's been so um, vocal in their, in their gratitude. As I said, really? I would echo all of those comments, Stephen, that has been really informative. Um, and reminder that everyone will receive a recording of the webinar this afternoon. So if you missed any of the slides, you'll be able to watch back over and, and take your screenshots there. Beautiful. Yeah, and I'll just say, if, if any of this stuff, you come up with some burning questions or are there things that you thought you didn't agree with, by all means, reach out. Um, if, you, if you type my name into, the internet search box, then I'm uh, sadly quite easy to find. And of course, I would love people to come out to visit our school, see what we're doing and uh, share best practice for sure. That's great. 
Thank you very much. Oh, we had a pre-service teacher join us as well, which is so good to see. Uh, so hopefully got some insights uh, yeah. from there too. Uh, yeah, Poll Everywhere is another, um, yeah, is a good, the, the tool I think you use for to getting our audience feedback is really cool. It, it could be something that you try with your students too. Mm, yeah, for sure, yeah. Awesome. Alrighty. What a wonderful opportunity it was to listen to you this afternoon, Stephen. Thank you again so much on behalf of everyone at ClickView and everyone in the webinar today and everyone who's going to receive this recording. So thanks very much. And thanks for If ClickView. anyone else is uh, looking forward to having a look at the next webinar that tickles your fancy, go to clickview.com.au slash webinar and make sure you sign up for the next one uh, that uh, pops out to you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again for your time and take care of each other and yourselves.